Uh, thank you everybody for joining us at our May 10 syndicate meeting. We have a great lineup of companies today and some great investors on our panel. Um, if you have any questions in the audience during the session, please go ahead and put it in the chat box uh, and we'll try to get to it. We do have a full lineup today, so it might take uh, some of those, might not. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Hall, our CEO at 10 Capital, to get things uh, going. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to have another great session of startups and investors for today's pitch presentation. I want to thank you guys. Each uh, company will have a 15-minute window to pitch and answer questions. We have two investors here on the panel with us. I'd like them to introduce themselves. Adam Bespinick, can you go first and tell us more about yourself and your fund? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me today, guys. Um, sort of the quick, quick background, been in venture for about a decade now. Started my own firm in 2020 called Looking Glass Capital, where we're investing in pre-seed companies largely, typically leading or co-leading those rounds across a few categories, namely healthcare, climate, education, and tools and platforms, specifically serving small and medium-sized businesses. And in the midst of uh, raising and deploying Fund 2 right now simultaneously. Great. Thank you, Adam. Pedro Sorrentino, can you tell us more about yourself and your fund? Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Very much appreciate uh, the invite. I have not been to, uh, I, I mean, I've done five South Lives, but I haven't been to Austin in you know probably like five years or so, so I, I miss it. Um, so I'm Pedro. I'm originally from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, but have been in the U.S. for about 14 years. Uh, I lived in Boulder, Colorado, then uh, eight and a half years in the Bay Area. I'm in Miami right now, but splitting time back again between SF and Miami. Um, and uh, I run a firm called Atman Capital. Uh, we uh, write 250K to 750K checks, pre-seed seed, have been in venture for about eight years. Uh, had a previous firm called 1VC. Uh, and before that, I was an associate at a firm called Funders Club. So throughout this eight years, uh, seeded probably 25 uh, unicorns, you know, Coinbase, Flexport, GitLab, um, Rappi. Uh, we invest in the U.S. and in uh, in Latin America. And uh, and we our firm is running a little bit of a different model where we have a group of uh, CEOs that we should deeply share values and principles. We only partner with people that, that we align in that regard. And uh, these operators are LPs in the fund as well. We have the regular LPs, but we actually provide leverage in the form of carry in our fund uh, to this collective. Um, whenever they bring deals to us or we appoint them into opportunities, but only founders that have raised venture, built companies that are worth uh, north of 100 million to about 10 billion or so. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to you know, listening to the pitches. Thanks, Pedro. So our first presenter today is Sean Shu of Botrista. Sean, thank you for joining us today. If you can go ahead and share your slides, we'll kick off with you first, and you'll have 15 minutes to pitch and answer questions. That's good. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Shu. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor and now an entrepreneur again. Um, I sold my first company in 2011, then joined Tesla 10 years ago as my second exit. I worked directly with Elon Musk and uh, left Tesla around five years ago, now building a beverage innovation company that is disrupting the beverage industry. So Arisa currently is the leader in beverage operation. A uh, little bit of the background of this industry is it's a huge industry. It's a $2.6 trillion market. Now, the only leader, Coke or Pepsi, only less, less than 1% of the market share. They're doing that $24, $25 billion in revenue, but the market, again, is $2.6 trillion and growing 8% year after year. Barisa <clears throat> is in early growth stage. We we started to launch a product 18 months ago. Now we, we basically are in a early growth with a couple million dollar book AR and now really fast growing to approximately 20 plus million dollars uh, AR in the past six months after we built out the sales team. <clears throat> the business model is B2B sales to AI and automation solutions. It's a self software as a service plus ingredient subscription model with a great recurring revenue. It's tackling a huge can, but service of a bit more market sum is still at $45 billion across six regions. <clears throat> this is our team. Uh, we're all experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, my, C my chairman is formal CEO at Red Lobster and Dr. Donut. Also a CEO at Burger King. 
uh, I've exited companies before already, I, as I explained, Jason Valentine is our uh, head of sales CSO. He built two restaurant chains and both exited to private equity recently. Um, we, we, we are backed by all the tier one leaders, including Sony Innovation Fund, which is good, and it'll be as well as with a lot of endorsement on the award side. The reason why we are all here today is because the consumer behavior changed dramatically since five years ago. Younger generations are all consuming these fancier cold craft beverages. It's health, considered healthier than soda, not necessarily like a ca caffeinated beverages anymore. It's like a refresher, recharger kind of beverages category. Even at Starbucks, this is the majority of their revenue from today. It's typically a six to eight dollar per cup drinks, and it's very high gross margin for them. The opportunity today is that there's no one actually looking at using those kind of category in different channels. When we look at the entire on-premise non-alcoholic beverage market in the United States, it's more than $280 billion retail value a year. If we do B2B SaaS and ingredient supply, then that will be at least $70 billion in that market. For this $70 billion B2B non-alcoholic beverage supply, like a good reference is Coke only do less than $2 billion right now in this sector with their fountain machine. Meaning that there are $68 billion of opportunity that we can uh, disrupt with this fancier cold craft beverages categories that, that the younger generations are looking for at all different channels. Across the six regions, we started with the United States. Uh, starting next year, we're actually expanding to different markets. Um, but keep it high level, U US is our main market. Uh, we look at, at any market that is high labor cost, high buying power, and um, basically high labor, uh, high, high um, I would say, demand on these kind of beverages. Our business model is basically just bring these craft, high quality beverages at anywhere. So, Restaurants, sea stores, offices, stadiums, hospitals, all the way to schools, all these new channels are where we are bringing basically Starbucks level beverages within the size of a fountain machine to all of the channels that fountain machine can enter. This US alone in the next five years, that's more than $70 billion market, we can do a, a terminal market at, at least $12 billion. Currently, this is where we are. Um, first of all, I want to start with our business model. We do enterprise contract, five to seven years contract with a revenue breakdown of 95% recurring revenue and 5% one-time fee on hardware. All of the recurring revenue has an overall gross margin more than 70%, just similar to SaaS. Uh, with this as a business model, our recent traction in the past uh, two years is we start from nothing, 2021 to the first $5 million book AR to now this year, we are targeting $48 million book AR. We are already half, halfway there now. And uh, next year will be $100 million plus to $300 million to, for IPO readiness. The beauty of our business model is that we don't need a lot of accounts to get to $100 to $300 million AR. Currently, we have uh, signed with Hao Guys, Yoshinoya, Shibli Donuts, BBQ chicken and, and numbers of uh, medium to small size chain restaurants. We also have large chain restaurants in the pipeline. Uh, roughly, this is how it looks like our, in our current pipeline. This year, we have approximately $100 million plus in the pipeline today. And we have uh, more to come in next year and, and then $2 billion plus by 2025, including some large size account as well. <clears throat> our business model is pretty straightforward. We supply the hardware the ingredients to the operators. They will operate the machine, clean the machine, sell the drinks with their existing traffic. So it's a very stable recurring revenue for us on the consumables, as well as high OPEX because we don't need to take care of the machine every day. Across the line, we actually collect every single uh, data of the drink sales. We know exactly what, where, when customer order these drinks. So we feed all this data to the AI that we built, and, and then we can come up with beverage menu recommendation, pairing recommendation, as well as the recipe recommendations. This is the secret of our business because that's how we actually find out what sells in these restaurants. 
you know, a, a quick little statistic on restaurants. 15 years ago, any restaurants, 30% of their net profit is from selling soda. And guess what? All these are gone now. Less than 5% of their profit is from selling soda today because no one is drinking soda. So what we are doing is not rocket science, but we just need more data to actually do machine learning on finding what are the drinks that people want in these restaurants to bring back that 25% missing net profit opportunity. Uh, it's restaurant level, 25% net profit is a lot. And that's what we do actually. So um, with the AI, we also come out with this automatic machine that <clears throat> basically automate the full bar within four square feet. We call this the Tesla in the beverage world because it's fully autopilot. It can auto automatically make drinks, it can automatically reorder, recommend beverage menu, all, all the great stuff. <clears throat> one of the critical variable entry in, in this business is number one, uh, food safety certification and, uh, and re regulation. Number two, the ingredient supply chain and our recipe uh, secrets. Number three, all the data uh, and all the AI piece of it, because we are the only one who knows all these recipes for our drinks. As well as, as, as well as all of the other drinks, like we know the recipe from Starbucks, Tim Horton, Jamba Juice, you name it. We know the recipe, the ingredients, all these uh, trade secrets. So then with this, that's how we build up the really strong AI engine to predict what customer want in different cuisine types. As a result, this solution can provide any craft beverages at anywhere. Any categories can be accessible on our machine. We're currently at more than 32 states, more than hundreds of restaurants with thousands of restaurants signed and committed with us. Uh, we're continuing to grow. Um, the, the secret sauce is the machine is very simple to operate, just like a Tesla. Any operator can unbox it and then start operating within 20 seconds of training. There's a training video on the website and they can just easily pick it up just like a Tesla or iPhone. So that's how we actually scale really easily. It's very easy to install, very easy to maintain and repair and operate. The key thing about our business is again the additional profit, right? Uh, for for a chain like Halal Guys, uh, they're making very few penny margin on selling their food, but they can actually enjoy a almost three dollar net margin on per cup when they sell our drinks. They're retailing at four dollars or five dollar per cup, and then they're paying us around one point five to two dollar per cup on the ingredients, which leaves them a huge improvement on drink sales. They typically triple their drink sales compared with soda drinks, and then uh, which also triple their profit or sometimes four to five X or of their profit. And this is across the board average. I didn't use any bluff number here. The, the range from our drink sales uh, for profit per store can range from $2,500 net profit per month per store, all the way to, uh, we've seen $55,000 per month profit per store. So, this become a very interesting opportunity for restaurant to actually gain additional profit, which is very critical for them as a profit center. Finally, um, we have been looking at ESG very carefully. Uh, the secret sauce about our business model is that we not only deliver high quality beverages by our dispensing technology, with our dispensing technology, we can also dispense high density and natural ingredients which when it's more dense, we save five to 10 times on the shipping costs during the logistics process, which also end up with a great carbon footprint saving. In our conservative estimation, by 2030, we're gonna save more than a quarter million tons of CO2 every year. Um, so here's roughly where we are. Uh, happy to talk about our barrier of entry and technology. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Zero Entrepreneur. Uh, I'm here to build a $100 billion plus business to disrupt the $2.6 trillion beverage industry. Um, I, we're based in San Francisco. We're not actively raising. We closed our Series B last year. Uh, now we're just here to meet up more potential investors and see if there's anything we can potential partner with or uh, you know maybe we will have a runs form up later this year or why not but just want to be here to uh connect with everyone here all right thank you sean and uh first up adam what's your question for sean 
Yeah, I mean, I was typing some of this stuff in the chat along with uh, Pedro, but um, I guess a couple of questions. One is balancing Batrista as a brand versus white labeling the product for, for your partners. And sort of along those lines, I guess, to what extent are you creating beverages that you're sort of, you know, I guess that are Batrista owned and proprietary that might be sold at Halal Guys and a few other partners and they're called something else yeah. versus Halal Guys comes to you guys with a recipe and you're sourcing the ingredients and it's being made with in your machines, but ultimately it's it's their IP, so to speak. That's a great question. Um, so I would like to share my vision. Uh, this is one of the biggest thing I learned from them is to have great 10, 20 years vision, but break it down by pieces. For Barista, in order to make Barista a $200 billion plus company, we will do B2C eventually. Uh, that will start very sharply after 2030, after we have the first three to $5 billion in revenue. But to start, we will only do B2B until that point. I would say not until $3 billion in revenue, we will not touch anything on um, B2C side of it. We want to capture as much data as possible. Um, every single cup of drinks, we actually know the recipe because these are not pre-mixed. Like the strawberry lemonades are so separate with stro strawberry line, with a uh, lemonade line and a uh, cane sugar line. So with that, we are monopolizing the infrastructure and the supply chain on the B2B side of it for all the ingredients, part of the business. With that advantage and data advantage, I like, give you a ballpark, we are going to have more data and more bargaining power on ingredients uh, compared with Starbucks in three years. So with that kind of data, uh, those are perfectly great for us to get to B2C. Uh, so for now, we focus on high gross margin, easy to scale part of the low hanging fruit of B two B business. We don't really we we do want to have we, when there's opportunity, we do want to do B two C branding. Like at least people know Barista inside. But for now, we don't have to emphasize that for now. Uh, B two B side has less marketing expense, higher uh, higher gross margin, and higher EBITDA, as we all know. Um, so to answer that question, that, that's that. And I also saw other questions on the unit economic side. So uh, our bond cost is less than nine grand for now, and we can, we can cut by less than five grand in a couple, I would say in, in, in a couple quarters. Uh, we currently make 20 to $30,000 a year per robot with 70% margin. So um, even if we use our cash to, to to do the capex investment, we can pay it back within like two to three months in average. But currently, we actually sell the hardware or lease it out based on other people's money to to pure lease. So we are not uh, worried about the upfront investment and return on investment aspect of it. Great. And Pedro, what's your first question? First, uh, Sean, congrats. Uh, it's very rare to see. Um... A hardware company that uh, has other um, other or other things together at this stage. Um, so my question is regarding competition across long-term contracts with Pepsi or Coke, uh, and how do you think you can continue to move product if there isn't branding um, associated with it? Um, you know, um, what's what, what's your take on that? Because ultimately, Coke or Pepsi, you know, they certainly rely on on their brand to, to move product. Yeah, there's a core technology that none of them figured out. We actually got reached out by Coke m and team. They wanted to buy us, but we rejected like three months ago. Uh, but I can, I am happy to share with you our core technology. Uh, the, the, the real secret is it's, it's pretty simple, right? We, nothing is more delicious than natural real juice. So instead of using chemical syrup, we use real juice puree. But none of the dispenser on the market can dispense puree. So currently, with our uh, our grammatic software-based dispensing technology, we can actually dispense any kind of liquid on our platform. Anything from mono syrup, which start by doing, all the way to puree, juice concentration puree, natural cane sugar or honey. This is we are the only one who can dispense this kind of technology. Uh, and with that, that this not only have an impact on our ingredients, but also uh, sorry on our dispenser, but also on ingredient supply chain. We have to 
develop our own supply chain, which we already did uh, on packing all these puree high quality products inside those back in the box cartridges format. We have global patents around all these dispersing technology as well as user interface and uh, the infrastructure on packaging of the, all these ingredients. And so, to we'll, we'll yeah. get the second point on, on branding, though, do you think that, because uh, at least I saw on the Halal example, uh, and, and I get congrats, by the way, on the $4 million in, in revenue. Uh, when I approach a restaurant that is, you know, using a Batista machine, um, am I just ordering, uh, you know, a rosemary-infused kombucha? Or, or you know, do they have names? You know, are, are your actual customers, you know, putting together um, uh, products, right? Like, so, hey, I'm, I'm ordering a yerba mate from this brand. I'd like this beverage. Like, how, how does that work? Yeah, uh, customer walking. Uh, uh, most of our drinks are similar to the the, the milkshake categories. It's a bigger ticket item. So you walk in, you look into like you know three categories that Hello Guys is doing. They do refresher, recharger, and some like uh, plant based oat milk. So recharger will be energy drinks. Refresher will be like lemonade and iced tea, and you can pick your own flavors. And it's all all branded by that. The machine will make the drinks at the back. The staff will basically pour your drinks. So it's seamless experience. Better quality than Starbucks, but you are paying less than Starbucks. Great. Thank you, Sean, for that. Uh, we're at the end of our time. Appreciate the questions, Adam and Pedro. With that, let's go ahead and move to our next presenter. We have Dominique Combs of Be Generous. Dominique, go ahead and share your slides and kick off. OK, great. Um, can everybody see the screen? Paul? Yes, we can. Great, I will kick off then. Hi, everybody. My name is Dominic. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Be Generous, and we've created a very unique type of proprietary technology, the world's first philanthropic credit product. So I'm sure many of you have heard of buy now, pay later companies. Well, we've created the first donate now, pay later technology, which allows a donor to make a charitable donation to a nonprofit. The nonprofit receives the full donation upfront right away. The donor receives the full tax deduction right away, but the donor doesn't spend any money out of pocket. And instead, the donor pays that donation later over three, six, or nine months completely for free. No interest payments, no transaction fees, no late fees, and no hidden fees. Uh, we started the company two years ago. We've raised uh, an $11 million venture capital round from some of the top VC and fintech investors in the United States. Uh, and we've had an excellent first quarter in the market. And with that, I'll get into the presentation. So as I mentioned, we've created the first ever philanthropic credit product modeled off of the buy now, pay later space, except with none of the bad parts of buy now, pay later. We don't charge late fees. We don't charge interest payments. We have no losses. And I'll get into all that in a moment. Uh, we launched last October. So we've been in the market um, about five and a half months. During uh, that time period, we processed about $600,000 in loan applications from donors. We've approved close to $1.6 million of credit to donors. We financed through our first test credit box about 132,000 donation dollars in donations. We've signed up 106 nonprofits as customers, and so um, you know the average B2B early sales cycle is usually two to three months. Our sales cycle is 18 days. So every two days on average, we've signed up a nonprofit. It's been blazingly fast. Um, our head of sales is uh, we did poach our head of sales from Blackbot, which is the largest software company in the world powering nonprofits who we've also partnered with, um, but he has 20 years of experience of selling a product into nonprofits. Um, so we have an excellent sales department. And not only have we signed 106 nonprofits, but we've actually signed some of the nation's largest nonprofits as clients. So a lot of name brand organizations like PETA, the Jewish Federation, the Humane Society, Heifer International. And as some of you may have seen, we've just signed the 17th largest nonprofit as a client, Food for the Poor, which is our first billion dollar a year organization. Um, that brings me to my next statistic here. Our contributions under contract, which is essentially the value of our sales contracts, is now at $1.4 billion, um, which is a very exciting mark for us to be at uh, five and a half months into the market. And perhaps most excitingly on this slide, uh, the average donation, the average online donation in the United States last year was $128. The average donation using Donate Now, Pay Later is $460. So we always had a hypothesis that people would donate more if they could obviously spread out their principal payments over time. If you compare this to the buy now, pay later space, you'll see that the, they can increase the average order value of a transaction by about 60 to 70%. That's the numbers that they cite. We're increasing the average donation value by over 250%. 
Or to put it another way, donors who use our product donate almost four times the size of the national average. This is a humongous increase, and nobody else in our space is doing anything like this. Um, our average loan credit score, so this is the average credit score of somebody who uses our product effectively, is 770. It's very, very high, which leads to the final number here, which is that we have no defaults and no delinquencies, not a single default or delinquency since launch, which keeps our bank very happy. As I said, we raised an $11 million venture capital round from some of the nation's top investors. You can see some of them down here that you'll notice. We also have some premier angel investors. Folks like the CEO of PayPal, Dan Schulman, is, um, he's the current CEO and president of PayPal, is one of our investors. The chairwoman of FICO, Joanna Reese, the largest credit rating agency in the world, um, and the co-founder of a firm, Hoi Lin, who was the founding COO of a firm, uh, was actually one of our early investors as well. So we have a great group of people backing the company. We also just found out that we made Fast Company's World Changing Ideas list for 2023. We were one of 29 companies that made the list out of tens of thousands that applied, um, which was a great honor. We just found this out about a week and a half ago, so we're excited about that. So this is effectively how our product works. Here you can see that we've embedded a Donate Now, Pay Later button directly on a nonprofit's website. In this website, it's the American Red Cross as an example. So a donor would come to the website like they ordinarily do, and they would make a donation by clicking Donate Now, Pay Later. Once they've selected how much they want to donate, in this example, the donor has said, I want to give $1,000, we perform an instant soft credit check and a KYC and AML check. This has no effect on the donor's credit score, repeat, no effect on the donor's credit score, and happens in approximately one to two seconds. So we're verifying their identity, and we're doing a soft credit pull and checking that against our credit box. And we basically take all the data that we have uh, 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 secured, such as verifying their identity is not synthetic, they're verifying they are who they say they are, doing a soft credit pull, take this information, and we feed it into a decision engine called Proveneer, which renders a credit decision based on our credit underwriting criteria. And then we offer them three pay three payment options, essentially. They can pay this $1,000 donation over three months, over six months, or in this example, over 12 months. We offer nine months today. Um, and what happens is once they select which option they want, the Red Cross will actually receive $1,000 right now. So the Red Cross is getting $1,000, which is solving their biggest problem, which is liquidity, because half of all nonprofits in the US have less than one month of cash on hand. And the, not, and the donor will get a $1,000 tax deduction uh, for $1,000, but the donor won't have spent any money. And in 30 days from now, the donor's first payment will come due, it will be automatically deducted from their account. And then of course, it'll be paid over three months, six months, or 12 months in this example, only the principal. There's no cost to the donor to use this product. So our product does four things very well. First, it solves the time value of money problem because money in a nonprofit's bank account now is worth a lot more than it is dripped in over time. One, due to inflation, and two, due to the need of nonprofits to use emergency capital essentially throughout the year. Two, our product completely eliminates donor cancellation rates for monthly giving and pledge defaults. So one of the biggest problems in the nonprofit space today is that uh, nonprofits a lot of times will get a pledge from a donor or will have a donor sign up to give monthly and then they cancel at some point. We hear from a lot of our clients, they say to us, we never ever have to deal with this problem again because instead of offering pledges, we just offer donate now, pay later. We'll get all the money up front and you guys basically collect the payments over time. And as I said, we have a 0% default and delinquency risk. But if someone were to cancel, it has no effect on the nonprofit. So our bank lender, which is Drake Bank, will actually just eat that loss if that were to happen. So this is a huge problem we're solving for nonprofits. Uh, three, our product increases the average donation size by three and a half times or 260%, much, much larger donations. And four, we hear a lot from our clients that say, we got a whole new slew of donors that either have never given to us before or said last year they couldn't give to us, but now they, because they can use Donate Now Pay Later, they're making a donation. So these are the core benefits of our product. I mentioned this data point a couple of times, the average donation size is much bigger. Uh, in our first uh, quarter in the market, our applications grew 438%. Uh, so we had a really, really great entr entry into the market. And our loan amounts requested, meaning how much money was requested to be lent out by our platform, grew over 1,000% in our first quarter in the market. Uh, here's some of our loan data. Uh, you can see that our average loan credit score is 771. It's very, very high. Our average donor age is 50, which is lower than the national average of 64. And most importantly, everybody always asks me, when you guys hit scale, are your delinquencies and defaults going to tick up? Our answer is no, because the average applicant credit score, this is not even someone who gets approved, just the average person who's applying has a 756 credit score. Um, I don't have time to get into you know, why it's so high, but during the q and I'm happy to get into that if, if anyone has a question about it. 
Here's a uh, visual representation of some of our clients. You'll see a lot of the nation's biggest nonprofits on here, like PETA, the National Down Syndrome Society, the Jewish Federation, the Humane Society, Heifer International, Food for the Poor, and so forth. Uh, we recently ran a donor study and a nonprofit study where we asked our, um, our clients if they would be disappointed if they could no longer use our product. This was a product market test um, study that we ran. 96% of our nonprofit clients said they would be disappointed if they could no longer use our product. 96% obviously very high. We ran the same study with donors. 76% say would they, they would be disappointed if they could no longer use our product. Generally, anything over 40% is considered to be product market fit, um, according to the Sean Ellis test, which is what this is based on. And we ran the study in January of this year. So the numbers were very, very high. And then we asked, would you use this product again to make another donation? And 85% of donors said yes. The visual representation of some of the numbers I talked about. We have just signed a partnership with BlackBot. BlackBot is the largest software company in the world powering nonprofits. To give you a sense of how big they are, they are a publicly traded company that processed over $100 billion of donations through their infrastructure. Not only did we sign a partnership with them, but the former president of BlackBot is one of our investors. And he actually invested in the company in 2021 and reinvested in the company in our most recent round. Our Product integration or partnership allows us to integrate Donate Now, Pay Later into a suite of BlackRock products, which will put us on tens of thousands of nonprofits collectively. And we're in the process of servicing this partnership as we speak. Uh, we've also signed a partnership with Shift4, which was a, which is a large payment processor that purchased a company called The Giving Block last year, also another publicly traded company. Uh, the founders of The Giving Block actually invested in Be Generous and then asked if we would do a partnership with them. This partnership, which we signed and we're currently integrating as we speak, allows us to integrate Donate Now, Pay Later into 2,000 of the Giving Blocks nonprofit customers, and we're going to be auto-turned on. So what that means is that right now we have about 106 clients who use our product. By the end of um, July, we'll have 2,000 nonprofits, which have our button on their website by way of this partnership. So we're going to 20x the number of clients we have by a direct integration with the Giving Block, uh, which and what they do is they do essentially payment processing for nonprofits. This is our bank, Drake Bank. They've given us a credit or lending facility where we can lend up to $700 million over the next three years to power our Donate Now, Pay Later loans. Here's some of the recent press we've done. We've been covered in all the major press publications. Uh, this just shows the size of the market as compared to the e-commerce market. The nonprofit market is massive. There's about half a trillion dollars of donations uh, annually to nonprofits in the United States, 1.7 million nonprofits and 72% of the American public donate to nonprofits. So it's a very, very big sector. The way we make money is that the nonprofit basically pays us a transaction fee of about 12.5% on each donation. Um, now, the nonprofit doesn't actually pay 12.5% because donors oftentimes will cover a portion of that. It's totally optional, but they'll cover. Um, but either way, basically us and our bank, we get about 12.5%. And then we split that approximately 60-40. Well, we will get a, basically a net of 4.25% on average per donation. So that's what we're netting out. Uh, and the donor doesn't pay anything to use the product. Our projections are over the next year, we'll do $51 million of gross lending volume, um, which will gross us about $3 million of income. We are on track to do that, um, which is exciting. The next year, we project doing $366 million of gross lending volume, grossing us $21 million. And then the year after that, $762 million, grossing us $44 million. Uh, this just shows the M&A um, space in the nonprofit division or the, the M&A uh, deal <laughs> flow in the nonprofit sector. Uh, it's been a, um, uh, it's a very, very aggressive acquisition market. We get reached out to, I would say, on a weekly basis um, with somebody trying to acquire our company. It's, it's very unusual, but it's a very, very hot sector. Um, we are constantly fielding calls from mostly private equity firms about this. Um, but this just gives a visual representation of it. And then just to round out the presentation, um, this is our current leadership and team. Uh, I'm a three-time venture-backed uh, fintech entrepreneur. Our COO uh, is uh, the former president of one of the largest foundations in the country. And before that was the president of one of the largest impact investing groups. Our CFO is the former CFO for Infinity Capital Management, the big hedge fund. Before that was an options and derivatives trader on Wall Street. And our CTO is the former head of engineering at MasterCard. Before that was at PayPal, Visa, and Vise, uh, where he led um, architecture. And our head of sales is a former global head of faith-based sales at BlackBot. These are our investors. Um, I mentioned them earlier. We have some of the nation's premier venture capital investors have backed us. Everybody from 116th Street Ventures to Canaan, Transcend Ventures, who invested in Klarna, Wilson's and Sini, uh, the nation's premier tech law firm has a, a venture arm. 
uh, who invested. ATX Ventures is the top venture fund in Austin, Texas. And here are angel investors. The first person there is the CEO of PayPal. Hoy Lin is the co-founder of a firm. Joanna Reese is the chairwoman of FICO, uh, and so on. And uh, we're raising a total of $13 million. We have already closed 11.2 million of that. So the round is about 86% closed. And um, thank you very much for listening to the presentation. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, Pedro, what's your first question? This question, uh, the go-to-market strategy, are you guys trying to settle HR at companies or uh, what's the best way, the most efficient way today that you guys have been acquiring customers? Uh, we have a direct sales team where we've been acquiring customers. We have a director of sales, a senior sales rep, and then sales uh, development reps. Um, but moving forward, we have these two massive partnerships we've signed with BlackBot and the Giving Block. Um, and we're going to approximately 20x our number of clients uh, over the next quarter by way of these partnerships. So that will be the primary acquisition model. And we're also releasing a direct-to-consumer product. And the direct-to-consumer product will allow any nonprofit in the United States to accept Donate Now, Pay Later. So we are currently building a product where somebody can come to BeGenerous.com, search any of the 1.6 million nonprofits in the United States, and use Donate Now, Pay Later to make a donation to that organization. So, so that will effectively turn every nonprofit in the country into one of our clients. And that's being built as we speak. Great. Thanks. And Adam, what's your question? Uh, why aren't other buy now, pay later companies doing this? I assume some are already. Uh, no, no, no one's doing this. We're the only player that... that uh, why, that why wouldn't they or what's stopping them from doing it? Um, nothing's stopping them other than their, their, um, their focus. So uh, I mentioned, obviously, the CEO of PayPal is one of our investors. I asked him, hey, you're investing in our company. You think it's a great idea. Why don't you just do this? I asked uh, the, the CEO of Affirm the same question. I'm also friends with Adam Ezra, the founder of Zip, and also um, the founder of um, Afterpay. Nick Molnar is also a friend of mine. Uh, so we've had conversations with all of them, and we've just directly asked them. And the answer that they've given us is, hey, we're an e-commerce company. We're focused on an e-commerce transaction. We're doubling and tripling down on the e-commerce vertical. We currently own less than 1% of market share in that vertical. We look at you as a, an investment opportunity and an acquisition opportunity. So rather than basically try to spin up a whole new division of the company, you also have to deal with tax implications and also the credit facility. A lot of their banks won't let them lend to nonprofits. Um, but technically there's no reason they couldn't to do it. They're just not focused on this market. Some of them have chosen to invest in us um, and others we're partnering with. So we're in partnership discussions with Sezzle, for example. Um, we just talked to their president a couple of days ago who said, hey, we'd love to partner with you. And maybe down the line, um, we can do something from an investment perspective. So most of them have taken the position that they believe in the product. They're going to invest or partner with us. And down the line, this we could be an acquisition for them rather than a competitor. Great. Thanks. We're out of time. Thanks so much, Dominique, for that great presentation and those good questions, guys. Our next presenter is Innovera, Mukesh Kapila and Stephen Clark. If you guys can go ahead and show your slides and kick off. All right, thank you. Um, hi, my name is uh, Mukesh Kapila. Um, I have my co-founder and partner, uh, Steve Clark, uh, with me here as well. Uh, my background is, uh, is in developing uh, environmental technologies for the past 30 years. Uh, we did an exit, uh, my partner and I did an exit uh, a few years back uh, to Schlumberger and uh, I worked with the Schlumberger and also Halliburton over the past few years and have uh, broken out and started uh, Innovera with uh, a couple of founders. <clears throat> so what we're doing is addressing uh, the uh, obviously the climate uh, with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, basically what we're trying to do is, is break into the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle works well when uh, uh, everything is in balance uh, where the, 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 through photosynthesis uh, we get uh, biomass material, biomass material decays and puts CO2 back in the atmosphere and that cycle continues. However, when we're extracting fossil fuels uh, from, from the ground and burning them, we're putting excess CO2 into the atmosphere. So our technology breaks into that cycle by taking waste biomass material and uh, converting it into uh, usable products, including, uh, including uh, uh, fuels, a uh, bio crude uh, and also um, uh, uh, carbon. Uh, so we have a less reliance on uh, on uh, fossil fuels. So we have uh, three patents pending, and uh, our uh, our technology takes a very wide range of biomass materials, uh, from forestry waste, uh, pulp and paper waste, uh, landfill, you know, food bio waste, uh, agricultural uh, waste uh, from from cattle manure, hog manure, and of course this you know sewage wastewater treatment plant, uh, the sewage from from that. 
All of those materials have a significant amount of carbon. Um, that carbon can be converted to a bio crude through high pressure and high temperature. Um, through that, you can convert somewhere between 30 to 55 percent of, uh, of the biomass material into a bio crude. So, for example, a, a, a typical uh, uh, Novera plant, um, when when we're when we built one, uh, we can take somewhere between forty-five thousand to seventy thousand tons of wet biomass material, depending on how much biomass and dryness there is. Uh, we, there's a simple pretreatment step to make sure it's in the right uh, oil, sorry, right biomass water and and, and particle size. Um, uh, a slurry, and then from there we apply the temperature and pressure, uh, followed by um, the separation of the bio crude from the from the water, and also the biochar slash solids uh, from uh, from that uh, from that stream, and then we recover about thirty four thousand barrels of uh, bio crude, and the the water that's generated in the process is simply recycled back into the beginning of the of the plant. Um, the a single environment uh, Vera plant uh, can. Uh, eliminates uh, roughly 4,800 uh, cars from, from the road or essentially 21,000 uh, tons of CO2 uh, per year. Um, this, is a, this is a net savings after all of the, uh, um, uh, all of the uh, uh, combustion of the, of the bio crude and uh, the sequestration of the, of the, through the carbon char and the transportation of getting product to and from and the actual processing of that material through our process called hydrothermal liquefaction uh, technology. So there are, uh, as everyone has heard uh, through the IRA, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, there are uh, billions of dollars that are going into, uh, into the industry, which is what we're uh, tapping into. And we have just started that process of uh, accessing some of the grant money that's, uh, that's readily available. But uh, the focus is uh, on, there, there is a huge trend towards uh, decarbonization of, uh, uh, of our you know, uh, decarbonization of, of, of all of the, uh, the fuels that, uh, and, and, the, and the chemicals that we're consuming. So if it's you know, uh, hydrothermal liquefaction technology, so great, why isn't everyone else doing this? Well, the, 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 the bottom line is that it's very, very difficult to do. Uh, very easy to do in a lab scale, relatively speaking. Um, you can get to, to the 3000 PSI pressure and about 300 degrees Celsius. If you have that environment, uh, you can uh, you can generate a bio crude. But uh, the challenge is to scale. Uh, at the moment, there is no commercial um, technology, no commercial company that can take a waste biomass material and uh, and convert it to a bio crude. Lots of pilot scale and uh, and, and bench scale testing has been done over the past uh, number of decades, but no commercial scale. And it's because it is very very difficult to do. As you can imagine, taking a slurry and processing it at uh, 100, 200, 400 tons a day, uh, that requires a significant uh, amount of, not only infrastructure and equipment, but trying to pump that slurry at uh, 3000 degrees Celsius and adding all of that heat to get it to 300 degrees Celsius um, and trying to recover that energy that you've put in to uh, economize your, your energy costs for the process takes a tremendous amount of equipment, which uh, does not exist today. Uh, they're, they're, just the heat exchanger alone uh, for something like this at this scale, uh, it just simply doesn't exist today. And it has to be customized with custom metallurgy and, and a massive footprint just for that, uh, that heat exchanger that I'm showing here. So then once you get it to pressure, then you have to cool it and then you have to depressurize it, which is a tremendous amount of wear and tear on, uh, on, on equipment. So this is the problem that we have solved. Um, our major competitors, uh, or Lysella, Genufuel, and Steeper, all of them have been, uh, uh, you know, have the same challenge of high pressure and high temperature uh, and all of the challenges that I just mentioned that go with that. But uh, we've filed, uh, we found a novel way of, uh, uh, of with, our, with our reactor that uh, solves the, uh, the pressure and temperature um, uh, barrier that is preventing everyone from, from scaling. So we filed three patents uh, late last year uh, we have two more in the hopper that we'll be filing soon. The end result is that we have a, a much lower capex uh, than what has been project, projected by, by our competitors, uh, low opex because of the, 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 the our reactor design uh, doesn't have the same wear and tear. And also, you know, given that uh, we can provide a higher rate of return. So how we do that is by utilizing a, a wellbore. 
uh, a well bore can be drilled or it can be a, a, a geothermal well or it can be any abandoned oil well that's uh, of, of which there are thousands uh, uh, around the world. So what we're doing is essentially taking the, our bio slurry and pumping it down uh, in through the production tubing uh, into a standard well bore design. Uh, this is not this is nothing new. Um, hundreds of thousands of wells are, are drilled all the time. Uh, what we're doing is pumping our slurry down in through the production tubing. And as it's going down to the bottom of the well bore, it, it's heating up. Uh, and once it gets to the bottom of the well bore in the last few hundred meters, uh, it then reaches the temperature and pressure that uh, is required for the hydrothermal uh, liquefaction reactions to take place. So once those reactions are taken place, then it converts to a bio-crude, which then returns up the annulus uh, inside the well bore. So uh, while it's going up the, uh, uh, up the annulus, uh, it's also all of that energy is being transferred to the incoming bio slurry that's going down the production tubing. So by doing that, we are gradually reducing the pressure over, over about 8,000 feet, uh, about 2,400 meters. And uh, that allows us to have the resonance time that we need for those reactions to occur, and also the, the surface area that we need for that heat transfer to take place. So it becomes a very efficient, energy efficient process that uh, is not matched by anyone else uh, that's exploring the hydrothermal liquefaction technologies today. So this is how our, our novel in, uh, reactor technology works. Um, our total addressable market, as, as you can imagine, is, is pretty massive because bio waste is essentially undepletable. Uh, as long as we live as humans on, on this planet, we are constantly going to be generating a, uh, a, a waste biomass. And uh, that waste biomass can be converted to a bio crude and other products. Uh, so from a TAM to a pretty massive size, down to a more manageable, uh, obtainable market size, we're targeting uh, the three main sectors, uh, pulp and paper mills, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, uh, biosolids, and also uh, livestock uh, uh, manure, which all of those three targets are very wet biomass materials, which makes them very difficult to apply other technologies such as say pyrolysis or gasification or incineration all of those technologies take up a tremendous amount of energy just to dry the material. Whereas in our case, we are able to take a wet slurry uh, and then convert it to a biocrude, which is a, a huge advantage uh, to uh, processing waste biomass material. So what we're, our basic model is to uh, charge a licensing fee of about $1.5 million per installation facility, and then, uh, um, and then sell licenses by sell licenses along with the blueprint of what a plant would look like uh, for the, for a particular customer. So this is, and we can go on location. We take up a very small footprint. For example, for a municipality that's of a city of a half a million people will generate about 70, 77,000 tons of uh, waste biomass material. Uh, one Anovera plant can, can manage that waste uh, and that, and our plant can go right at the uh, can be positioned right at the uh, at the source of the feedstock, therefore saving a lot of transportation and logistical time. So we have uh, where we are today. As I mentioned, we are a startup. Um, we are uh, at the pilot scale pilot skill stage at the moment. Uh, we've been funding our own um, uh, pilot skill uh, uh, testing. Uh, you can see some pictures there of our team and uh, and and our pilot scale reactors. This again is is only at. Uh, uh, at about 50 kilograms an hour, between 20 to 45 to 50 kilograms an hour, depending on type of feed material. Uh, and uh, this is where we're doing our testing. But our, our seed round is to go to, a, um, uh, go to the field with, uh, at a well bore, which we have identified. We've identified two uh, locations where we would uh, uh, take our, our uh, technology and apply it to, uh, to a well bore. So we have a um, uh, a three-year cycle for development. Uh, our fundraising is for $5 million. Our seed round is $5 million to get us into the field. And then from there, uh, we will uh, continue to, uh, to fine-tune our processing conditions and then increase our processing capacity and then, um, uh, and then going commercial after that. So our, uh, our use of proceeds is to uh, um, hire a CTO, which is on, on contract at the moment, and hire some staff engineers 
uh, and also some specialty consultants in the geomechanical uh, engineering side of things. Um, this will provide us about a 15 month uh, runway to till we get to the next phase of, uh, of, of advanced testing. So uh, we are uh, between the, uh, the, the team, the development team, we have 48 patents. Uh, I have uh, 17 patents myself um, the developing uh, environmental technologies such as this. Um, my VP of technology, Richard Bingham, is very uh, equally capable and, and uh, has been doing a lot of work uh, in, this, uh, in this space for, uh, for Schlumberger. Um, Barry Hoffman did an exit uh, for his technology in, uh, at Halliburton and uh, some of the other uh, gents. Those are my sons, if you're wondering if the last name is familiar. They're all engineers. I have, uh, I have a chemical engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and um, an environmental engineer. And uh, so we have, we have a wonderful uh, uh, discussion around the dinner table. Uh, on the advisory team, um, we have just brought on Johanna Hagstrom. She's a VP at Lanzatech. Uh, Lanzatech did uh, the largest deal uh, in this space uh, just at the beginning of this year through a $1 billion SPAC. Uh, the other gentlemen are all highly academic, and, but also have businesses. Uh, so they have both, uh, both uh, a business and um, uh, and academia experience. So uh, they're very, very, um, very well rounded in uh, both uh, in both business and in um, uh, and also in uh, uh, academia. Uh, on just in summary, uh, just leaving some some a few minutes for questions. Um, we're addressing a very large market and undepletable uh, uh, an undepletable feedstock supply. Um, we have a very unique technology that's uh, protected uh, through uh, three, uh, three patents uh, pending, plus two more. Um, we are addressing, a, I think, a, a very large market the, 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 for just decarbonization of our society. Um, and also, there is a very large uh, uh, obtainable market that we feel just in North America and Europe alone. And we're raising uh, $5 million for a $20, $20 million uh, valuation. So that, uh, that completes our our presentation, leave it up to some questions. Great, thanks Mikesh. Pedro, what's your first question? Mikesh, I, uh, really cool that you have your, building a business with your sons. Um, I, I'll be very honest with you, I'm not an energy investor, so uh, I, I, this is just so far from what we typically do that it's just uh, difficult to, to just grasp uh, uh, around it, but, some of our LPs are heavily involved in energy, so um, I'm happy to help you uh, in order to send that to you know a few families that are involved in the energy business. But uh, I, I don't have a specific question. I'm sorry. Sure. No, no Thanks, problem. Pedro. And Adam, what's your first question? Um, Great. So my first question would be around um, who the actual end customer is here in terms of who is going to be licensing the facilities. Like from what I understand some waste to energy, waste to value, uh, you know, development, some are municipal, some are private. Um, so how do you think about those facilities being financed, recognizing that they're gonna have to pay you, you know, million and a half dollar licensing fee? Um, so just curious sort of what your, who your target end customer is first. So the, our, our, our end users would be municipalities who are constantly, are already managing this waste. Uh, the large agri-food, um, you know, uh, industry uh, businesses, I should say, that are managing their, you know, uh, uh, animal waste at the moment. So any um, any of those companies that are generating that waste are are spending money to manage that waste now. What we would do is provide them with an option to you know, to ma to manage your waste through our plant and give them back a bio crew, give them back a bio asphalt binder. Uh, that can be sold for for value. Uh, carbon credits is another uh, is another way to harness that value. Uh, and then soil amendments. The, for example, on the municipality side, uh, the, the 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 products that come out of our process are pathogen free and have uh, mostly pharmaceutical free. And some of the PFAS materials that are forever chemicals, they're also reduced significantly through the process. So there's other values that are created, but those would be our end users who would then pay the money for the license and build the plant. So, uh, but we could do it yeah. for them or they would, uh, they would give us the, the license fee and build their own plant. We would provide right. blueprints to do so. Got it. And so one other question I have is just around, well, I guess it's two, two parts. One on the transport is the assumption that these, these groups 
already have transport sort of baked into it. So it's on, it's not an issue for transporting of waste to the facility. Yes. The, it? it's, no, it's not, a, it's not a way, it's not a problem now because they're doing it today. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess, aren't some of these feedstocks already being transported to other um, waste to value, waste to energy yes. operators? So I guess, um, how, yes. how do you think about sort of competing with where they're already sure. shipping some of this waste to? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good question. The majority of wet uh, biomass materials are going to a landfill or being, or, or being spread on the ground uh, because it's, the, the other way to harness the energy from, uh, from biomass materials is to make sure that it's dry first before then you can convert to carbon or pyrolysis type process or incineration or gasification. Those all require an initial step of drying the product first, which is why this is such an attractive uh, proposition because you, know, you cannot dry um, waste biomass material because it's just got, it takes up too much energy to dry it before you can harness it. Uh, so in our process in hydrothermal liquefaction, we don't need to dry the material. It works as a slurry. It works with you know when it's when it's actually wet. Got it. Okay, Great. I'm an Thanks, investor. In a, we're, yeah, we're at the end of our time here. Afterwards, I'll send you a message to connect. I'm an investor in a company that could be could be relevant. Sure. Great, Adam. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Mukesh. With that, let's move on to our next one. Prefix James Billado. James, can you go ahead and kick off your slides there? And here we go. Um, my name is James Billado, founder and CEO of Prefix. Uh, we're just now launching our Series A round. Uh, to put it simply, uh, we eliminate the hassle of home maintenance and save our homeowners between 30 and 50% off home maintenance costs. So I'm not, I'm not going to bury the lead. Uh, I'll start with a quick summary of where we are and uh, why we're moving forward with our next round. Uh, we've demonstrated growth um, that uh, is, has accelerated uh, month on month. Uh, we're at about 10% growth uh, monthly. Uh, we're now at 5.5 uh, million in annualized revenue, uh, launched multiple new metro areas across the last year. Um, as we've done this, we've maintained an NPS greater than 80, uh, which is well above anything we've seen in the home services space, uh, let alone most industries. Um, we've also shown we can expand into other high margin services, HVAC, uh, full service HVAC being one of them, uh, strategic investor Watsco, largest distributor of HVAC in the US uh, has been helping us with this. Um, and now uh, we can expand more rapidly with almost no acquisition cost uh, through strategic partnerships um, with some fortune 100 companies I'll tell you about in, in just a little bit. Average homeowner spends between uh, $3,000 and 30 hours a year on what's fundamentally a, a broken process. Um, it's usually unreturned calls, service windows, sometimes exploitive pricing, and general confusion on what ongoing preventive maintenance is needed in the home. This is one of the biggest consumer problems there is. Yet until now, there really has not been much innovation addressing the actual problem. With Prefix, you get your own dedicated home manager. We hire primarily military veterans, with impeccable records and a strong work ethic. If anything breaks, you just text, call, or email. Home manager takes care of it, usually for just a small copay. So no online searches, no contractor blind dates, and no wondering if you've gotten the best possible price. Your home manager also comes to your home, forms a 30-point preventive maintenance twice a year. And by 30 points, I mean clean your AC condenser and condensate line, change your air and water filters, flush the sediment out of your water heater, uh, clean the lint out of your dryer outtake, sanitize your washer and dishwasher with a natural cleansing agent, change all the batteries and your smoke alarms, and I'll stop there uh, so we have time for, for questions. For the minority of things that your home manager can't do, you get one of our vetted contractors that we manage all the way through to completion. So you still get low negotiated rates with no markup. We've com com created a, a completely new category of home care by focusing on three main pillars. First, uh, which is frequently neg neglected, is what I call our human code, or the repeatable processes around hiring, training, and motivating our full-time employees. We've gotten really good at this and directly take advantage of the ongoing shortage of skilled tradespeople that most people experience wherever they live. We hire full-time employees after an extensive vetting process, again, primarily military veterans who've shown excellence during their period of service. We select for the psychographic traits we know will delight customers, 
and then place them in our own rigorous training program, uh, spanning the classroom, custom built training facilities in all of our different regions, and infill training with experienced home manager, uh, home managers. Uh, finally, um, culture can't be underestimated. Uh, ours is supportive, team-based, still fosters an entrepreneurial drive and, and rigor at the last mile. All of our employees have an ownership stake in the company, and we look for the, the uh, performance that that implies. Second, our tech platform goes hand in glove with our unique operating model. From the customer's perspective, we're super easy to communicate with. We have the equivalent of uh, Amazon One Click to enroll in the service. Homeowners are able to see all the work we've done, even how much money we've saved them in their home health report. So we reach that ideal of sort of the electronic medical record that we're striving for in healthcare. We do it for the home. The data we collect means we know how to fix things right the first time and uh, has a number of other uses we'll discuss in just a minute. Uh, third, it's the way in which we create operational density. This is an actual neighborhood in Austin. It's the Mueller neighborhood. We have a third of the total homes in some neighborhoods. We know a few other products, particularly in this sector, which have this kind of addressability. We've rolled out our model across greater Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and most recently, Dallas. By contrast, existing competition solves none of the problems we just mentioned. There are two archetypal models uh, that are useful uh, for reference. Uh, marketplaces, they're funded by contractors, may lower search costs for the consumer, but really address none of the problems we just mentioned. They use disparate, independent contractors and simply can't control for, for quality and create trusted relationships with homeowners. And then there are home warranties, which are really just bad insurance at odds with their customers' best interests. Uh, they make their margins by uh, also using 1099 contractors um, that are undercompensated and then overlay this concept of insurance um, and only make money by denying claims or not paying enough to contractors. Either way, a customer usually loses. Neither model creates trusted relationships or the ability to monetize them. So we solve one of the biggest customer problems there is. But home maintenance isn't the extent of our business model any more than books was that of Amazon's. By doing the work of solving the broken home maintenance process, we fund the creation of an operating system for the home and trusted sticky relationships with homeowners. This enables us to offer a number of other higher margin services, both to consumers and to industry partners. In terms of direct to consumer, we start with margins of 36% uh, through uh, a monthly subscription and co-payments. This is recurring revenue. We've been steadily increasing these margins as we continue to offer other high margin services. We stood up our own full service HVAC installation company, as I mentioned, sort of an Amazon basics of HVAC. Uh, it's it's uh, much less than competitors and, and uh, uh, very well received by our, our customer customers. Um, we continue to expand into other services, uh, preventive maintenance of our existing service. Um, it lowers underwriting risk for insurers. Uh, we also provide a highly cost-effective way for insurers to install and maintain telematics, which is a problem. A third of all smoke alarms are inactive. Uh, telematics and smart home technology, numbers can be even worse. Uh, a number of other higher margin services uh, that will now be rolling out in the near term. Our core home maintenance uh, service alone is worth $20 billion in the U.S., but some of these adjacent markets into which we're expanding represent even larger opportunities. Our relentless focus on solving the real customer problem, customer problem in this space, um, it earns us the right to an additional and important part of our business model. The same data that helps us serve individual customers so well, highly valuable and aggregate to both consumers and industry partners. The data we already collect enables us to determine cost to own, market share for all appliances and systems in the home. Companies like Consumer Reports, JD Power, they make hundreds of millions of dollars from initial quality assessments and our data is better. And those are just a, a couple of examples. Um, we have a no, number of others in our product roadmap. As we hit new records of growth, we've not sacrificed customer experience. Uh, we have near perfect reviews in Google. I've maintained an NPS of more than 80 and very low annualized customer churn. We achieved series A metrics with just our own direct to consumer marketing playbook. But over the last eight months, we've entered a new phase of growth. We've partnered with USAA, one of the largest and most well-respected insurers in the country, and NRG, major public utility with millions of customers in Texas alone. By distributing us, they instantly get us to profitability in any territory where we launch, 
all at almost no acquisition cost. Importantly, we're highly strategic for both of them, not just some add-on uh, or nice to have. Uh, for an insurer, as mentioned, we can lower underwriting costs by as much as 20% by some estimates. For a utility, we can help them provide other energy-related services to escape the commodity trap of deregulated retail electricity. The last mile problem has been the constraint to a lot of residential adoption. We have something uh, uh, slightly more than 2% solar penetration in sunny Texas, which doesn't really make much sense. Um, they both prepaid large uh, scale pilots, which in themselves get us to series B metrics. And, and that's just two partners uh, with national reach. Um, we're already working with national real estate brokerages and in discussions with home improvement retailers, builders, and private equity firms with large real estate holdings. Many of these potential strategic partners could also eventually be acquirers once we've achieved significantly more scale and realize the value we'd like for our investors. I describe our model, I don't know if this is a dated term or not, but uh, high growth with a margin of safety. Uh, in an uncertain environment, uh, our sector has shown very low correlation to economic recessions. Uh, the re recently passed Inflation Reduction Act provides for up to $4,000 per customer, uh, a homeowner, uh, if they switch to elect electric appliances, $7,500 for the purchase of EVs and the corresponding need for EV chargers, 30% off the cost of root rooftop solar, home batteries, and geothermal all great, but but represent very complex sales that an individual homeowner is left to manage. And we're perfectly placed with a trusted relationship-based approach to help them. To paraphrase uh, Ray Dalio, uh, we've demonstrated three uncorrelated paths to growth. We keep going deeper in the markets in which we operate. This isn't a thin, broad marketplace. Uh, we have very high addressability. We've now successfully demonstrated our city launch strategy. We're in four of the 10 largest cities in the US. We've shown we can monetize these trusted relationships by expansion to other higher margin services. And that's before we get into the data related services I mentioned previously. We've got a great team. This isn't a founder led company, it's a team led uh, one. Uh, we don't hire just for logos. Um, instead, uh, we ensured each member brings specialized experience well aligned to driving growth through the early stages of category creation, where processes uh, need to be defined and replicability established. And our team extends um, out, outside these walls. Um, as advisors, we have Julia Cheek. She's the founder and CEO of uh, Everly Well, uh, probably one of the most successful uh, direct-to-consumer startups here in Austin, now valued north of uh, $3 billion. Uh, Jay Steinfeld is the founder. I just got a text from him about 10 minutes ago. Uh, founder and CEO of Blinds.com, uh, one of the largest acquisitions of Home Depot. And uh, Rob Chesney is our lead partner at Chicago Ventures. He was COO at Trunk Club and head of eBay Motors. Other uh, operator investors on our cap table include the Uber Syndicate, Jim Ryan, the former CEO of Granger, Jim Finnegan, one of the co-founders of SoFi, and Dean Draco, uh, founder of Barracuda Networks and now Eagle Eye Networks. Um, to close, we're raising $8 million for our Series A. Uh, it, it's just going to continue to accelerate this gro growth, which includes uh, expanding our data and developer team, deploying more working capital to rapidly roll out, roll out our profitable territory model, add resources to develop and launch new partnerships and bring on more specialized direct-to-consumer resources. Notably, all of our growth to date, I'm not sure if this is a good thing or bad thing, has come with no dedicated business development or marketing resources, and we think it's time. With that, open up to questions. Thanks, James. Our first question, Pedro, which, what would you ask? First, I love the fact that you're hiring uh, veterans. Uh, that's great. And, Thank you. Uh, I don't, are you a veteran yourself? I'm not. Uh, most of my family uh, was, and uh, just uh, it's it's been good for us, and it's it's good for them too. It just uh, it's a natural fit. That's great. Well, uh, thank, thank you, you for their service. Uh, the 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 question here: Why not go W two like everyone else and partner with you know local businesses? We are W. I'm sorry. We are W two. You said that everyone is a, an employee. Maybe I missed that. Yes, um, so we're mostly W-2, and it's only for the more special uh, uh, So just contractors, I apologize. Oh, sure. Um, if we were to go back to that slide, um, and I can uh, dig in on, on sort of contractors and their shortcomings. Um, if you were to, to um, look, at, look at marketplaces, they don't show up. They can charge you whatever they want. Um, uh, you're left to provide quality control them 
yet this is your house. Um, so uh, the 1099 model, we're coming off of a consensus era where maybe ride from point A to point B, uh, Lyft is having some trouble, Uber seems to be making a profit. But like, as soon as we extend into even grocery delivery, we start to have some difficulty. Um, get into home maintenance services, more complex services, gig economy starts to break down. Perfect, thank you. And my second question uh, would be uh, regarding the cyclical sales, right? Because you know you're not need, you don't need maintenance. Uh, what's the recurrency behind it, and where typically you guys are seeing the the cohorts of repeat purchase per customer sure. uh, stabilize? Uh, I don't know the revenue mix, so you know this is a more open ended question. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. Um, so we are a subscription based model. It's forty bucks a month for the average home. And that includes that preventive maintenance uh, regimen I described twice a year, which would cost three times as much if you got it separately. And then $40 of fix um, for anything that we do in our primary care model, which is 80% of repairs. Um, and so that amounts to about four repairs a year, 40 bucks a month. You're getting to about $640 a year in revenue, solid recurring revenue. And then if we were to just go back to that, the first slide, I won't, I won't make you scroll, uh, watch, have to watch me scroll back, but um, that uh, band of yellow is where we're expanding into other services that we distribute alongside this core service, and it's just the first of many. Great. Thanks, James. And uh, Adam, what's your question? At, at $40 an hour, I guess, how much are you giving to the home manager so if you're generating 640 in top line what what are the margins on that sure um so in a mature territory it's 36 percent um and mature territory we can do about um 540 homes that's a senior home manager and a junior home manager together or for a developing territory um we with one home manager we'll do like 270 homes they get paid on average around 60,000 a year um, junior home manager starts at 50 and then senior 70. And then if they move to a city manager, they go up from, from there. Um, so that's where that 36, that's the cost, part of the cost side of that 36% gross margin. And on the customer acquisition front, how are you balancing the sort of single family versus multifamily? I see landlords on the, on the site. Yeah. Um, and what has been the strategy sort of between those two? We've kept uh, that on there. That's our sort of our next um, in, in vertical that we're going into more heavily um, after insurance and utilities. Um, single family has been what we've done to date. Um, multifamily has different requirements. It'll be a lower price point, probably 30 a month. And then um, each building is different depending on um, what type of AC equipment they have. Um, and uh, frequently they want... Um, maintenance of uh, common areas. So we do several buildings, but SFR, uh, single family has been our bread and butter so far, but we're definitely headed towards um, either uh, institutional landlords of multiple single family. And then I'm staring at some of the big buildings downtown. Uh, we're in one of them, uh, we'll be in more. Great, thanks guys. That was a great presentation, James, and good questions from Pedro and Adam. Our last presenter is Pivot CX, Howard Bates, and uh, would come and join us with that. Uh, Howard, if you go ahead and launch your slides, this will be our final presentation for the day. Okay, great, thanks, Hall. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a little different format here. Uh, actually, it's gonna be a shared presentation with my co-founder, Mike Seidel, and myself. So with that, um, we'll bring the deck up and we'll get going. Yeah, thank you, Hall, and thanks to the 10 team for putting this together. It's been uh, enlightening sitting here and watch some of the other presentations. I'm Mike Seidel. I'm the CTO here at Pivot CX. This is Howard, who's our CEO. We're the founders of Pivot, and uh, we're simplifying talent acquisition and HR communication. So slow and ineffective communication causes about 74% of HR and recruiting teams to miss business objectives. Recruiters in HR spend, uh, spread out communication across 21 different systems. 60% of communication is missed. People, e you know, recruiters emailing when they expect, and when the candidate expects a text message, um, HR people calling and calling and calling and never connecting. 50% of recruiting advertising spend gets wasted because qualified candidates never hear from the recruiter. 
The Society for HR Management reports that 62% of employees cite a lack of communication or poor communication as the reason they quit. Turnover is very expensive operationally and financially. So here's what really sets Pivot apart. We're creating and leading a new category in work tech, the communication hub. Our leadership team and advisors have 70 years of industry experience and 30 exits. We have product market fit validated with customers like Kelly Services and Great Clips. And more importantly, we're ready to scale. We're competing for a share of the $54 billion USHR tech market, and that market's projected to grow at 20% per year until 2030. So how do you solve disjointed and ineffective communication that makes your HR team and T talent acquisition team log into 21 different systems? With Pivot CX, our communication hub for recruiting in HR connects 128 different hiring and HR systems and enables everyone from recruiter to hiring manager to HR to communicate via text, voice, video, and email and replace as many as 10 different systems that recruiters and HR people have to interact on a, a daily basis. Most importantly, we're enabling recruiting and HR teams to personalize communication at a scale that they, they just really couldn't do before. Our product's really designed uh, in a way that allows humans and bots to be combined to automate and accelerate common recruiting communication tasks without forcing our customers to change their applicant tracking system or their HR information system. Try to make it so they protect that big investment that they already have. Our business model is pretty simple. We're just a B2B SaaS company. Most of our customers contract with us annually and pay us monthly. And with upsells, our average order is significantly more than our list price. Just a quick look at our pipeline. We launched our product back in January of 2021, and we managed to grab some really, really, really good logo wins. And we'll talk about those in a second. Our pipeline's really healthy. We built it without having our own internal sales team. We have a small number of customers that we work on direct. And most of our deals come through a pipeline of channel partners. So let's take a look at a couple of our marquee customers. Community Health Network, the largest employer in the state of Indiana. That's our home state. Um, we did a deal with them, $56,000 a year. They prepaid for the first year. And that's gone so well that it's positioned to grow to $89,000 in ARR on renewal. Kelly Services, we got our first deal in from them. It's projected at $88,000 in ARR. And that's positioned to grow to about 250,000 in ARR. Great Clips, 4,500 stores, 750 franchisees. Almost everybody they hire goes through Pivot CX. First year was a prepaid 319,000 in ARR. We've delivered more than twice the results that Great, Clip, Great, Great Clips expected us to. And we still have four months left on the contract. Uh, we, we think that one's probably going to renew. Our go-to-market strategy leverages channel partners and our own direct sales. Channel partners allow us to grow our sales and service delivery capa our cap capability more quickly and at a lot lower cost. We're able to really leverage the fact that a lot of our partners already have a sales team. They already have a service delivery and consulting team. And they can get our product uh, deployed and, and out there quicker. We've already made a big investment in building that network of partners. Here's a look at a few of the partners that we have. And so, you know, Really good question is why do they choose Pivot CX? Why do they partner with us? Well, um, it's simple. Only Pivot CX works across all four communication channels, and we integrate with five times more systems of record than anybody else that does candidate or employee communication. We've built a very unique capability to deliver candidates to hiring decision makers and even bring them into the conversation. So for franchise organizations like Great Clips, they're able to recruit at the corporate level, deliver those candidates all the way down to the hiring manager at a store. It's uh, There's nothing else like it on the market. Uh, thanks, Mike. So what I'd like to do is just share a little bit of the leadership team uh, that we've got here. Uh, so one thing uh, we want you to clearly understand or get a, a picture of is that we have very deep domain expertise in this uh, world. Uh, as Mike said, we have over 70 years of experience in the HR and tech recruiting space, over 30 exits, one of those being public. Uh, we really know the space intimately. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm really passionate about this business and really on somewhat of a mission uh, because I think all of us here in business know that people generally always make the difference in a business. 
And this is one of the really unique ones that I've had a chance to be a participant in where there's really a win, win, win situation. Candidates, employees win by getting more communication. How many, how, how many of us on this call have applied for a job and never heard anything? Zero. Uh, employers win because they get the right people. And quite frankly, we're winning too because we're bringing those, those folks together in the most efficient way that's ever happened. Uh, also, I'd talk a little bit about Mike. Mike and I have worked together now for five years. We complement each, each other's skill, skills very well. Um, and just to put it in perspective, he's probably one of the best product uh, creative builders I've ever worked with. And I just want to give you a little, little point, data point on that. Mike, when he was 16 year old, 16 year old, 16 years old, was actually writing commercial code for medical devices. So he's a really talented, gifted guy. David Bernstein um, has spent his entire career in talent acquisition. Uh, has been involved with, you know, as a VP of sales for many, many different companies in this space, as well as many Silicon Valley startups. <clears throat> so I think, you know, uh, everybody here wants to know about the performance, how are we doing, what's this really look like? Mike indicated that we're clearly a B2B SaaS based business. So let's take a look at our performance here. Uh, what I want to highlight is, First of all, we've got real revenue with enterprise accounts in a pretty short period of time. So I think we're validating our Valprop with them. We've got double digit year over year growth. Uh, if I look at just a couple of the SaaS metrics that are important, efficiency and so on, like our LTV to CAC ratios, 36 to one, which is we're quite efficient. Uh, the one that I'm probably most excited about right now because it all relates to growth and that's what we're all thinking about, you know, these businesses growing profitably as CAC payback. Right now it's two months. So that's really telling us that what we're embarking on, which is raising some money to grow the business, we convert that very quickly and efficiently into recurring revenue. Gross margins are solid at 65%. Uh, I'll make a comment about that. We're not up on scale yet. Some of the companies you've heard earlier are much further along uh, than we are. But um, I think as we look out into the future, these will be in the 70% range. And many of our partners right now are telling us that we should be raising our prices uh, because we're delivering that kind of value in the market. Uh, and finally, uh, where's the business going? Where do the projections tell us um, we can be? So we're looking at in three years that we can sustain over 100% growth in this business, uh, finishing out 2026 with, this is gap revenue, 19 million and approximately 4 million of EBITDA. As, as a SaaS company, we can look at that and go, we can harvest that, uh, we could sell the business or we could reinvest that 4 million of EBITDA back into growth. And the market, as Mike showed you earlier, is growing at a 20% CAGR. So that could be, uh, you know, the way we go. Thanks, Mike. Okay, um, the next slide here is just to give everyone on the call a sense that there's a lot of activity in this space. So really outside of uh, AI deals and so on, uh, the HR tech sector is still very, very hot. Just to give you an idea, in Q1, there were 23 VCs that invested 2.3 billion in 88 deals. On the M&A landscape here, we've got 12 billion that went in into 31 deals. And some of these uh, big, big public companies that are name, name recognizable companies like Workday did five deals, ADP did eight. Um, so a lot of traction, a lot of uh, opportunity in this space uh, going forward. Okay, so what are we asking for? We want to get to really get to the point here. So what we're trying to do right now is raise 1.5 million, which is a bridge to our Series A. We believe that will be in Q1, Q2, uh, when valuations and so on, we hope, uh, begin to uptick. Uh, and that'll allow us that 1.5 million, which will be primarily used for business development, uh, will get us to a level of where when we go to do our Series A, we're all as investors in this feeling very comfortable that we've maximized what that that uh, you know what the dilution would be and what we do with the capital. Um, so again, most of this resource will go into sales expansion. Mike needs probably one or two additional software engineers uh, to accelerate our product roadmap uh, for some key things. And then I'll just highlight really quickly the key terms. So I know this is important to you guys. We've got a term sheet. We've got a convertible note. We're 
happy to get over to you. So it's a convertible note, 10% accrued interest, 20% discount. We've already raised 200K and that's all through uh, management uh, as well as existing investors. So they've already done that at this level. And we put a cap in there. We know you guys uh, are, are really interested in what that is and that's very meaningful. So we actually have a cap in there of 9.8 million. Uh, with that, I mean, we're kind of through the formal presentation to give you guys a feel for what we do. Um, we'd love to, love to take questions or get comments or any feedback that you got. This is actually our maiden. Yeah, let's go and have Adam talk. Adam, what's your question? Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, one question I have is what is the onboarding, what does the sales cycle look like and what does the onboarding look like for uh for customers and have you found seems like sector wise you're kind of all over uh all over the map um in terms of the variety of companies that you've sold into so far but curious if there's a, a specific sector that you found resonance with or you think that there's going to be more resonance with well um so we provide a lot of value and across the across the ecosystem of different companies i think mike was sharing with you that we really believe that 60 percent of the business can be driven kind of in the SMB space. There are a large number of companies in that space and our monthly fee to them is somewhere around 2K. So it's not a big expense uh, for them at all. And we think that most of those can go through partners that already have relationships and channel support and the rest, the enterprise level stuff, uh, we think we'll probably address that through either consultants that are in this space. We have a large cadre of consultants that see a wonderful opportunity for them to drive um, consulting revenue around our platform. Uh, Mike can talk about onboarding. Yeah, he has basically automated that process and the on time the, to do it. On the tech side, um, you know, our typical implementation cycle for a large enterprise, we we took great clips from online in uh, less than five days across the whole thing. For smaller customers, it can be uh, as short as you order at nine in the morning and you're online at ten. So we can we can go pretty quick. We know that our ability to onboard customers quickly is the key for us growing quickly. Great, Next question. Thanks. More questions? Uh, I think I want to give Pedro a chance to ask a question there. I've got a question. Uh, thanks for the pitch, guys. Uh, the So how it, it would be very helpful to actually have seen the product itself, mainly because, uh, you know, as a seed investor in Greenhouse and a few other uh, ATS companies. So does this integrate multiple ATSs or what's the usual tech stack for for your customer um and and what are the features right yeah. that they're that they're using uh, when 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 hiring you guys so Pedro we built our software to integrate promiscuously and so we we can hook up to 54 different ATSs right now um a little over 60 HRISs and about 28 different uh employment CRMs and we have the ability to plug into multiples. So we already have customers that are RPOs, that recruiting process outsourcers that work with their own ATS and they have clients that are using an ATS like Taleo and they're able to plug into that and orchestrate communication across all of that. Really what we see out there is a lot of really good software and Greenhouse is pretty good. We're actually, we're actually integrated into Greenhouse. So, so that is a platform, mid-market platform, Pedro, that we're already integrated with. So we, we uh, did that answer your question? Uh, uh, yes, I would love those to see some product like uh, screenshots you can email me after. But uh, and then I guess the, the other question is, I don't know if you guys had enough execution time to observe uh, Lend and Expand, um, you know, ACV expansion through your, throughout your customers, because I actually like the ACV price point. It's not it's not a cheap solution um, and, and it's good. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the, uh, if you go back, Mike, maybe to that slide on some of our larger accounts, uh, and you look at ACV uh, expansion there, this is this is really very positive. Um, if you can look at community, we started out with 56K of ARR, they prepaid that. That is right now budgeted to go to 90K, that's expansion. Uh, within the account, they're doing more and more with us. So that's that's great. 
Kelly Services, guys, I mean, many of you may not be in this space, but that's the second largest global staffing RPO business on the planet. They could have put anybody into that platform. Mike showed you the competitive matrix there and our functionality. And somehow at a very early stage in our business, we were able to win that. That actually could grow to 250K over the next 12 months. Great clips. Uh, I don't think we touched on this, but basically they gave us 319K. We're doing Canada and the US. They want some additional uh, things for us to do. Uh, Mike and I are right now are projecting that out to be 450K of ARR uh, across the board. So give you a sense uh, of this. So companies that start with our product can increase teams. They might have more recruiters, people that want to use it. They can expand the usage of the product, which there's some consumptive aspects to it, like messages and voice and minutes. Those are all built into the platform. So um, yeah, it's it's not intended to be a cheap solution. Uh, we've also tried to build in uh, margin for our partners at an initial level of 20%. So if you look at our, our average contract value and say, this is what it is, we want our partners to be able to make at least 20, 25 points on our solution to take it in. Great, thanks Howard. That's a great uh, presentation today. We're at the end of our time, a little bit over. I want to thank everybody for their presentation. I want to thank uh, the investors for your great uh, questions there as well. And with that, we will take all of the questions in the chat box and send them out and get answers back to you guys on that. Appreciate that, uh, everybody, with your presentations. And with that, we'll go ahead and close it up for today. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone, for giving us your attention.